Hey, thanks for watching. This is another session from the second annual HVACR Symposium. Bert and I did a presentation on ductless or mini split cleaning best practices, maintenance best practices. You can find all this information from speedclean.com and just look for their ductless or mini split cleaning guide or maintenance guide. Um, I actually helped to write that for them and all of the information or most of it from this presentation is contained there. But hope you enjoy. This is Bert and I talking about ductless cleaning best practices. All right, so this presentation that we're going to give is really designed to be significantly longer than what uh, we're actually going to spend on it. But I wanted to definitely have a demonstration element to it because that comes up a lot, actually wanting to see what we do when we clean ductless systems. The first thing that I want to get out, out of the way right away is that the stuff that we show you is the stuff that we do because we get a lot of people who don't believe that and who will, you know, dispute that it can be done or that it can be done in a timely fashion. These are best practices. That means that if you're doing this regularly, yeah, there we go. If you're doing this regularly, this is the, the best way to do it. Are there cases where you're not going to go through and do all of these steps? Sure. I'm not an advocate that you need to take a brand new unit that's six months old and do all the same stuff you're going to do with an older and dirtier unit. I think one of the biggest things that we make a mistake on is that we take technicians and we tell them, you always have to do it this way, and then they get disenfranchised with what they're being told because the reality in the field is, is that it's not always necessary. So it takes a discerning technician. You're never going to replace a discerning technician with the process, but we are talking about a process here. So you got to give yourself a decent amount of time. What would you say... To, to do a really good ductless single head maintenance, what would you say the, the right amount of time would be? If I'm using the bib kit and cleaning this whole thing out, I'm probably doing an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. And that's in, that includes even pulling the blower wheel if necessary, which a lot of folks talk about how you can do it without, you know, use this kit without pulling the blower wheel, and that makes sense in some cases, but in some cases, pulling the blower wheel is just a, a good practice. It, on most systems, most ductless high wall systems, if you get good with it, you can get that blower wheel out in probably 10 minutes, you know, something like that. It's usually, usually not worse than that. And so uh, and it depends a lot on your market. People who are in dry arid markets will talk about how it's unnecessary, it never happens, because that's because they don't get the growth on the blower wheel that we get in a you know, climate zone one like we're at here, or any sort of humid climate. In our market, blower wheels on these things get really dirty. And it has something to do with the electrostatic charge, I think, of the, of the blower wheel because it's not made of metal. And so it doesn't discharge and it just kind of statically attracts the stuff. It clings to it. And also the cups on the blower wheel are really thin, so you got to get those clean. So anyway, we'll go into the specifics now. I want to in introduce everybody to Bert, Bert Testerman, otherwise known as, yeah, he wants a, he wants a round of applause. Yeah. Um, Jesse has done a lot of the, actually a lot of the content in this uh, presentation, which is also a guide from Speed Clean. A lot of that was done by him. A lot of the photos in there are of him. He's done a lot of ductless cleaning. A lot of our technicians have because we work in a market called The Villages, which is the largest retirement community in the U.S., and we install a ton of these in that market. And so these are the products and the procedures that we use to do this. Again, having, you know, just to cover that it, you don't have to always do it the same way every time. Some people are going to have a little different twist on it. Um, but what we're showing you is going to be the best practices. So let's jump into it. And again, like I said, some of these slides I'm going to go through really quickly um, just for the sake of time. If you don't know what ductless is, you know, I don't know what to say, but because, uh, you know, it's been around for a while now. But one thing to discern is when I'm talking about different designs, a cassette system is a system that recesses into the ceiling. They're becoming more and more popular. High wall is one of these guys right here. This is one of our installs in the villages. And floor inducted designs are also becoming more popular. So your strategy of how you clean them is going to vary significantly depending on which one you're working on. And when you're talking to a technician, especially if you're in leadership of an organization and you're, and you're talking about processes, you have to discern between these because they're not going to be the same at all in, in how this process is done. All right, so configurations, again, a lot of different configurations. This would be what we would call a, a multi-head a multi or a multi-zone unit. Um, these are becoming increasingly popular, especially in markets 
where, you know, especially in markets where maybe it's not primarily a cooling market, where humidity isn't uh, a big concern, or where you have historic homes. So places, um, you know, like the Northeast are very popular, they're very popular out West. Um, there is a whole bevy of concerns with this, though, which is why maintenance is so critical, because this is a, a really important thing if you're ever involved in the design side. This may be great to install, it may be very efficient, but think about having to clean all of these heads because they have to be cleaned. It doesn't matter what market you're in. The process may be different depending on what market you're in, but these things have to be cleaned. And if you're sitting this thing over top of a location that you're not gonna wanna get up there with water and cleaner, then you're gonna set yourself up for a lot of pain and suffering. And we see this a lot. So from a design standpoint, that's always really important to consider. All right, a lot of key advantages to ductless. One of the biggest being, um, uh, that you don't have to have as much labor and in installation, you don't have to have as much materials and in installation because you don't have a ductless system. Even if you use what we, you know, what we call a ducted mini split, mini split and ductless are kind of used interchangeably. Sometimes I find myself saying a ducted ductless, which of course makes no sense whatsoever, but even when you have those types of systems, generally they have really short duct systems. So you're able to put the unit in a location that you wouldn't have been able to traditionally put an air handler, and those would be what we'd call pancake units or, or low units, whatever you want to call them, compact units. And so you can fit them maybe above a ceiling space, run a shorter duct. A lot of them are what we call low static systems. So if you ever are installing a ducted mini split, pay attention to the specifications because a lot of them are designed for very, very low static pressure. So the duct systems have to be designed for very low back pressure. And a lot of the failures that we see associated with those units are people putting them in and just running ductwork to them like you normally would. And that's a, that's a serious issue. If you want to know how to size ductwork for them, we've got other presentations from, from Ed Johnawak especially that's going to talk about that. They're, they're lighter, they're easier to install. Generally, you can install a head and a condenser with a single person. Um, they even make you know, tools that allow you to uh, pull it away from the wall and work on it. And there's you know, different strategies you can use, but generally it reduces labor in that way. And then also the inverter-driven technology does help in terms of efficiency. So the numbers from the factory often look really good. Caveat is, is that sometimes as installed, they don't perform the way that the numbers look on paper, depending on the market you're in and the way that you install them. So, so designing them properly, sizing them properly, all that is just as important, and I would say almost more important in some cases with ductless than it is with ducted. The days of when I first started installing these things where I'd be like, hey, you know, put a 24,000 BTU unit in a little sunroom because, hey, they, they turned down to this really low capacity. We've learned that that was a huge mistake, and there's a lot of impacts to that, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons that is right now, but it's it, you, especially in humidity-rich environments like we have here, high moisture content environments, it causes a lot of suffering. You're just standing there. Shouldn't you be doing something? Yeah. Like, any, that's better. Yeah, I don't like people being higher than me. It's just, it's a, it's an ego, it's an ego problem here. Hey, who's this ugly guy in the picture? Look at there. Huh. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't clap for him anymore if he asks for it. He really likes attention. Uh, I don't, just him, not me. Uh, so ev all of them require servicing, all of them require cleaning. A, a mistake that we can make when we see systems like the speed clean system that we're gonna show you, or the coil jet, is that uh, people will get the idea that like, oh, this is easy. It's a lot easier. And even more importantly, it's much better in terms of preventing damage. So that's the main reason that you use it, and you have to know how to use it, and really anyone who's gonna clean ductless systems regularly, needs to have a way to make sure you're going to prevent damage because these things are mounted on people's finished walls. So you have to know how to do it. But it's not easy. It's something that requires practice and it requires preparation. And it requires a measure of disassembly. Now, depending on, you know, the strategy you're going to use, it may be just as simple as flipping up the front cover and pulling the filters out like, did with this one. like you did with this one. And in this case, he actually took the door off too, which is super easy to do and worth doing because then you can take it outside and clean it. I still would prefer anything that's easy to pull off, take it outside, clean it. Just get it out of there, right? So you don't have to worry about it. That's not hard. What gets difficult is you've got an evaporator coil, you've got a blower wheel in there that aren't necessarily as easy to clean and require some, some discipline and some forethought. All right. Some reasons why maintenance is critical on ductless systems. <laughs> All 
All right. Smaller coils mean that when you have soil that bridges those smaller coils, when you have something that's getting on it, whether it's you know, fungus or cottonwood, regardless of what it is, um, it can impact the operation more quickly. And those of you who have seen issues with ductless systems where the blower wheels get gunked up on them, they go from working to not working like that. Like one day it's cooling okay, and the next day it's not doing anything. Like it's moving no air. So that has to do with the size of the blower wheels. It has to do with the design of the blower wheels. The evaporator coils are smaller. The condenser coils are smaller, which means that if you don't have a really clear strategy for maintaining ductless, if you're installing ductless, then you're going to get into trouble, meaning you're going to have unhappy customers. So you want to have a really clear strategy. They also have very little filtration. A lot of the, and again, I, I, you know, I, I talk to these companies. They're not, you know, they're, they're good companies, but they put in these little extra filters, these little goofy things that go in addition. That, that stuff doesn't do anything. These things are terrible at air filtration. Let's just be honest. I don't care about the electrostatic cling charge that they put on the filters and all that. That is not, that is not significant air filtration. You know, unless you're putting a nice big media filter on your, on your high wall unit, and I'm not sure how you're doing that. Uh, you're building a really weird metal fi fitting off the front, maybe. Unless you're doing that, you're not filtering the air very well. So that means that that stuff's going to get stuck on the evaporator coil and in the blower wheel. If, you, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, becomes if you don't maintain it, it won't work with ductless. And again, I understand that if you're out west, if you come from Utah, it's not going to be nearly as bad, which is why you see VRF and VRV really popular in arid climates where the drains backing up isn't as big of a deal and the maintenance isn't as big of a deal. In markets that you have high moisture content, stuff grows more with high moisture content. So that's something you, you, have, to, you have to definitely consider your market before you start to select which equipment you're going to use. VRF, VRV is an excellent technology. It's, it works great, but it has to be designed for and maintenance has to be planned for. Another thing I didn't mention yet in terms of cleaning is pumps and pans also have to be cleaned and cleaned regularly. You will get lots of problems with condensate. Have you ever seen the ductless system that's sitting up on the high wall and the, you know, the, the drip that's been coming down the wall? I know because I had one in my master bedroom that I failed to clean the drain line in time, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's okay in your own house where you can accept it because it was your own failing. When it's your customer's house and it's dripped on their computer or their Ming vase collection, that gets expensive pretty quick. Bert agrees. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you have anything that you wanna you wanna add in, you know, you could just you could just snatch it right away from me. You know, just yank that away. You know, like that. You're a strong young pup. Clean and well maintained systems. It's more than just does it work, does it cool. It's about is it energy efficient and is it gonna last um, for a long time? Is it going to last for the long run? Um, BTU performance is a really good way to assess that though, and we're gonna talk about that as we get towards the end. Is it producing the BTUs that it's designed to produce at the wattage that it's designed to produce it at? That's the end of the day question that we want to answer with every piece of equipment, but with ductless, that's actually almost the only way to assess their performance. So you're going to want to know how to do that. And then obviously, if you keep them clean, they're not going to break down as much, which is also a good thing. Also, if you keep them clean, it's less likely that a junior technician is going to go there, find out that it's not working, and rather than figuring out that it's because of cleaning, put a bunch of refrigerant in it, and then mess the charge all up, which also happens a lot with ductless systems. Ty's, shit, Ty's nodding his head back there because he knows. He teaches this. You go to a ductless system that's got a dirty blower wheel, dirty evaporator coil, whatever, and they show up, and this thing's not working right, and they just start, of course, adding refrigerant because Freon is the answer to everything, or the TXV. Luckily, these don't have a TXV, so they were then the replace the EEV with a TXV or a piston. <laughs> All right, so key things we need to do on a maintenance. We need to pre-inspect first. If you're showing up and you're immediately starting your cleaning, stop doing that. You want to make sure that you pre-inspect first. Go ahead. You said yeah. I'll let you yeah, go. yeah. This is important because if uh, anything is not working on the equipment, it's your fault because you started cleaning and it, of course it was working before you showed up. So. Yeah, check everything else out. You get a scope of what you're about to do, but also you confirm, is there actually a problem? Because you know what it's like when you get the call, oh, I just need a maintenance done. All I need is a maintenance. There's no problems. And you show up and nothing's working. How long have you been waiting for this maintenance? Yeah, that happens. I like how you did like three different voices there. You were like the customer and then you were yourself. That was good. So the pre-inspection is huge, but then after the pre-inspection, communicating any prior issues, and communicate all prior issues. If there's, 
the screw covers are missing, communicate that before they were missing after you touched it. If there's issues with the filters, if they're torn or damaged, mention it first. And those are the sorts of things you want to assess. Is anything noisy? Is anything broken? And is the thing working? That's what I would start with. You hear anything weird, you see anything broke or missing, and is the thing working? Uh, and if any of those are, aren't working, then address it with the customer. Now, how do you pre-assess? I don't, I don't want you spending a lot of time on this pre-assessment. I'm literally going to go to beer can cold. Walk outside, check condenser discharge, grab that suction line, just like we've always been taught. If it's running, that's, that's, I'm not going to go through and do a whole assessment, especially since I haven't cleaned it yet. Right? And so, of course, it's not going to perform like it should until it's been cleaned. Then clean, then confirm its operation non-invasively, which we're going to talk about, and then communicate what you did. I'm going to rush through these steps. They're pretty obvious. Um, you can check the discharge air. That's probably a better way than beer can cold. Um, you know, I just said that, so, and then I forgot what slide I had in here. I would probably just do beer can cold, honestly. But anyway, uh, so you can check your discharge air temperature. One nice thing with ductless systems is the discharge air temperature stays pretty consistent regardless. When it's working and it's at high, so that's first thing you got to do, put it in cool mode, drive the temperature way down so it goes to full capacity, you're going to get pretty consistently the same discharge air temperature. And, and generally speaking, you know, 45, 50 degrees in that range. So even when it's warmer than that, you get higher delta T's on ductless. And people will say, what should my delta T be? Well, on ductless, it's not even stable. It's more your discharge air temperature is, is fairly stable. What do you think, Joey? D you, you disagree with that? Okay. You want to fight? Wrestle? Okay. <laughs> Tickle fight? I know, I know. Well, see, the, the thing with Joe is, and this is true of a lot of people who are sitting here in person watching this, is that I know they're actually smarter than me. And when, as soon as I see a facial expression, I'm like, did I say something wrong? Yeah, okay, good. Do you know why that is? It's, it's because that's how it kind of dictates. It, it's really trying to hit a target coil temperature, and so it ramps the compressor based on that. And so it's not completely fixed. There is some variance, but when you go to high speed, you're going to see consistently. And that's why you'll see really high delta T's when you have high load. Now, there's a high and low limit to that. It's not like it's going to run a 40 degree delta T if it's 90 degrees inside the space. You know, that's not going to happen. But you are going to see fairly consistent discharge temperatures when you're at set point, when you've achieved, uh, when, you've, when the space is at temperature, I should say. All right. And that's on there. So, see, I did have beer can cold here. Field test the suction line. Anyway, it's just fun anyway. Are you really a technician if, when you walk up to a condenser, you don't feel the discharge air and grab the suction line? That's what I want to know. I don't think you can be a real technician if you don't do that. All right, protect the customer space. This is all fake because it's showing Bert actually protecting the customer space, and he doesn't believe in that stuff. Yeah, no, he actually does. Yeah, he's got his shoe covers. Bert had a previous life as a painter, so he knows all about that. Yep. Lay down drop claws, prepare the area. Um, here, you see, <laughs> you see in this picture here, um, this mirror, I would probably, if it comes off easily, I would probably go ahead and ask the customer if I can pull that off the wall or ask them if they want to pull it off the wall. Probably a better way. See, I adjusted. Ask them if they want to pull it off the wall, and then if they say you can do it, then you might. Company policy, follow what your company says. This is my master bedroom that this picture's taken in, so it would be fine. And if he broke it, I would just take it out of his pay. That's a joke. I am, oh boy. <laughs> There's none on the ceiling, stop it. This isn't professional. We have very important corporate sponsors here, okay? <laughs> visually inspect the full system. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're not seeing anything that's visually showing an issue. The one that I prefer, I mean, again, you gotta do safety, shut off power, confirm it's off, all that. Um, I always want you looking for tubing rub outs. Um, there's actually in the, in the Slack group, there's, a, uh, there's actually a bet on how many times I'm going to say rub out in the, uh, during this uh, event. Uh, but that is the right name for it when tubing uh, creates a leak because it's rubbing out on other tubing. Uh, that is something to, uh, to inspect for. Electrical connections. And then biggest thing I suggest is look for signs of oil. So you see any signs of oil, you see anything... Uh, on your flares, especially on ductless, because flares are the number one leak point. You see any signs of oil whatsoever. I don't care if you put bubbles on it and don't see bubbles. 
because you can get really small micro bubbles. I mean, you want to get it on there so it's nice and still and then watch it, but I would suggest getting your electronic out at that point. Again, make sure that you're not just picking up excess from your ports, but flare leaks are so common, and if you can save a flare leak while you're there, either on the air handler or on the condenser, wherever they are, um, a lot of times you're not going to be able to get to them on the air handler, but wherever you see oil, address it when you're there. In terms of value to the customer, that's enormous. Anything with, with wires that are chafed, see? That's what a chafing, that's the word I need to go for. Um, anything that you see that's, a, that's due to the operation of the system and damage that you can prevent is a bigger value to the customer than almost anything else you're gonna do. And in terms of maintenance, that's huge. Because if you do that maintenance and then you walk away and three months later there's a significant problem of any kind, that customer's not gonna be happy if you could have prevented it. And they don't always know, but they're not happy either way. So while cleaning is critical, a huge part of ductless maintenance or any system maintenance is preventing future breakdowns by using your eyes and looking broadly and catching things before they become a problem. All right, next when you do your cleaning, you're going to definitely wear PPE. The biggest thing is safety glasses by far. Uh, most of the cleaners that we suggest to use with this, really all of them that we suggest to use with coil jet and with the ductless is going to be uh, essentially neutral cleaners, non-caustic, so non-acid, non-alkaline, or at least only mildly alkaline cleaners, and diluted appropriately, diluted to the, kind of the mild concentration. Um, you do not want to create damage to that evaporative coil because in a lot of these coils, that copper is super thin. I mean, super thin. If you've seen ductless units, and we've seen plenty, that start to get attacked um, in, due to chemicals even in the air and formicary corrosion will form right in the center of these coils. When I first started seeing it, I didn't believe it. I thought there was like something in the manufacturing process, but you actually strip the fins away and you'll see this little formic leak right in the center. And that can happen if you're using caustic cleaners. So in terms of your equipment, you don't wanna use caustic cleaners and uh, in terms of your, your meaning your, your cleaning equipment and the equipment itself, Condensate pumps, yes, yes. Condensate pumps is a big one. We we had some we had some techs running some nasty stuff through condensate pumps, and they would fail shortly thereafter. So yeah, you only want to use very very mild cleaners. We got a question from the back. No, there are foaming cleaners that are still neutral, um, or or very close to neutral. I mean, again, and I'm not I don't I don't know exactly what the pH is, um, but you want to definitely have something that's not advertised as a is an alkaline, you don't want something that's going to, and again, it, it is generally the strong alkaline cleaners that are like the crazy foaming ones, the ones that look really dramatic, um, but you can still use cleaners that are, you know, mildly, uh, mildly foaming um, that still work, and generally speaking, to be safe, I would suggest using cleaners that specify evaporator cleaners. That, those are your safest ones. They're going to be the most neutral in terms of, and they're going to cause the least corrosion. Anything that says it's an evaporator self rinse op option is also going to be mild because it's designed to actually sit on the coil, so you can use that too. And again, you'll find your favorite favorite products that, that work best for you. Um, clean the air filters, obviously. Blower wheel, evaporator coil, condenser coil. Remove debris from the condenser base and wash the coil. This is just a good practice anyway because you got your compressor in there, you got everything in there, and if debris starting to build up and water starting to get in there, you're gonna to begin to get corrosion. In these units, everything is really close together, so you wanna prevent stuff from getting in there in the first place. And then clean the drain line and the condensate pump, if applicable. And cleaning the condensate pump, the reservoir, the screen, all of that is one of the biggest things I see get missed. Um, so if you got one, you gotta clean it. What about using a, like a silicon enzyme like Viper Spray? Yeah, so, the question is about using something like Viper, a silicon enzyme. Um, we use it, and it works good. Uh, the thing I would be careful with, though, is that you have very low tolerance for anything that's high, highly viscous. And so that Viper spray is more viscous, meaning it's, it's thicker. And so I, I wouldn't suggest getting that into your pump. I, like, I wouldn't blow it straight into your pump. If you want to put a little in there and then blow your line out or something like that, that's fine. But the same thing is also true. Like, you don't want to apply that to a drain pin that has water in it. You don't want to just spray it right on top of the water. That's not how you use that product. You get the drain pin cleaned out and then fairly dry. It's not like it's got to be bone dry. But you get it cleaned out and fairly dry, and then you spray it in there um, because it's just going to, it's going to be less likely to cause problems. Because of the silicone, it is a, it's, it, it's just thicker, you know. So, and we have had a few issues with that, right? 
Yes, and it's 10 o'clock, so I was just going to let you know that. So that's about, about 20 more minutes. But I think we're covering some decent stuff here. You know, I don't need to be rushed. OK, so run tests and observe. Take key measurements. We're going to go over what some of these are. Um, but we already talked about discharge air temperature is one of the best. And suction pressure and superheat at full cooling can be valuable. But it's mostly just telling you, you mostly are just looking for a really low number. Some cases, even zero. Um, a lot of manufacturers are going to tell you not to do it at all because they don't want you messing with the charge. Uh, and that's fine. I, I'm not telling you not to do what manufacturers say. But if you use a probe um, that's not going to have loss, you know, you're comfortable with it, you know, the Schrader disengages properly, so it's just going to be a little tss. That's the technical term for it. Um, then that's not going to be significant. And you can do that if you want. You know, we, you get some markets where customers just really want to see you hook a gauge up. And if you're going to do that, use a stubby. But that isn't the most valuable measurement. And then uh, check your applied voltage, check your amperage, make sure that that's all, all what you would expect. We already talked about some of this. All right, so let's, we're going to go ahead and move forward to the Mitney Split bib kit and the coil jet. And Bert's going to do a quick demonstration. Are you ready to do a demonstration? Are you? Okay, all right. So you want me to, yes? Yes. So... Yes, I do. So like um, you have the, the drain right here, and I'll disconnect it from a pump if it has it, and I'll actually push up in and clean that as part of uh, before I actually flush out the whole drain. Because there is, it seems like in this plastic, there is buildup that happens in there. And if you don't push something like a small brush through there and actually clean it out, it, yeah. Yeah, so use the brush with the pan, the drain, the port, all that. And really, you do want to kind of, if you can get in and disconnect it, that's the way to go. Pumps make it challenging because not everybody installs pumps in the same place. Sometimes you can get to the reservoir, but really getting to the pump can be major surgery. So that's not always going to be the same. Generally speaking, the discharge line of the pump, so long as it's run properly, isn't going to clog because it's got that pressure. You know, that's not the part that clogs. It's everything from the reservoir or before it actually gets to the pump that becomes the problem. So anything that's under pressure, you know, condensate clogs because it doesn't have that, that pressure to it. But be really, really thorough with the reservoir itself, with the line that feeds to the reservoir, the pan, all of that, brushes, all that sort of thing. So what's that? A lot of times you can take the air handler, unclip it from the bottom, and lean it out, and you'll have a gap about that much. And so you can pull, um, be, because you still have your copper connected. You don't want to disconnect copper to clean anything. So that's about how much room you'll have for the cleaning. Again, remember, he said with a condensate pump. So if you have a condensate pump, you've got to get to wherever that reservoir is. So wherever the reservoir is, that's where it's going to connect. And so that's what we're talking about here. You, you, it, there really shouldn't be a circumstance in which you can't get to the reservoir. If there is, it's installed wrong, and you should quote the customer some sort of new solution to install the reservoir in a place you can service. Because if you don't service the reservoir, you're going to have problems. Again, if you're in Utah, you're in you know, Death Valley, California, maybe, maybe it's not a problem. But in Florida, Louisiana, where I come from, Groveland, Florida, we have to maintain our, our uh, reservoirs. So you got to get to where the reservoir is. So Bert's going to now demonstrate. I'm going to do like play-by-play. -play. I've always wanted to be a sports announcer. So um, you're not going to be able to hear the color commentator. OK. I'll, I'll just hold it here. Here you go. OK. So okay, go ahead. it's mine. It's mine now. Yeah, just walk away. Yeah. So um, at this point, I've left the main face cover on, which is not that difficult to take off. Um, but I just wanted to show you that you can take off the, the front door here and the filters out and very quickly ask, access most of this. Um, when you're setting up your bib kit, um, it'll take a couple pra practice runs to be quick at it. And so it comes with directions, which is also great, with pictures. So um, I already have this set up here in place. Um, one of the things that they, they did to help you not make a mess is these um, back plates here that go behind your unit. So what you'll do is you'll stuff these up underneath the air handler and that'll catch the random drips that aren't pouring out where the blower is. So that will be necessary and then you take your bag and you tuck it in behind that 
and that will keep your wall clean. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that is a, that's a really commonly mistaken and incorrectly done part. I mean, again, you know, uh, read the fabulous manual. Uh, that makes it a lot easier, and they have really great instructions. And also, uh, this guide is available. I, I'm quite certain it's still available on the speedclean.com website, which gives you know step-by-step -step instructions. This is all based on that guide, which you can download the free PDF. Um, so Bert is going to use the the coil jet here. Do you want to put it up on the table so everybody can see it there? I don't know if they'll actually be able to. Um, coil jet is probably you know e easily the best way of doing this to get good flow that's actually gonna be effective at cleaning. Some people will use pump sprayers, and you can use a pump sprayer, you just don't get, you don't get the, the flow of water. Again, this isn't gonna produce pressure washer type of pressure that's going to potentially damage the coil, but it's gonna produce enough flow that you can actually get a really good, really good cleaning on it. It makes that little, like, kind of like sound, and that's just when it pressurizes. When people first use it, they expect it to be running all the time, but it's not going to. It's only going to start running as pressure is escaping. Purrs like a kitten. So you can see, even, even right now, his handle, because this, is, this thing's been in service for quite some time, his handle's even dripping just a little bit. But because he has a mini-split bib kit, it's not going to hurt anything. If you've ever taken a pump sprayer into somebody's house on their carpet, what are the odds that that thing doesn't drip at least a few drips? I mean, it's just not going to happen, and it creates complete chaos. So when you're working in an environment where you've got to clean a ductless system, a lot of people will say, well, I just pull it apart. Well, that's great, but you're not pulling the evaporator coil out, right? So how are you going to clean it? Well, you can use a brush. Well, I mean, it's not going to get it really clean. Now, again... It isn't to say that this has to happen every single time, but when it needs it, it needs it. I remember, <laughs> I remember the first time I had to clean one of these was in a data center. It was a small data center, and I got to it, and the blower wheel was completely gummed up. I mean, just really, really bad. And I didn't know how to clean it. I, mean, I couldn't. The thing's over, like, racks, you know, of computers and stuff. And, and I, so I literally took high-pressure nitrogen and a shop vac, and I started blowing the blower wheel with high-pressure nitrogen. Well, you can imagine that shot back caught all of that, not. You know, like, I'm panicking because I just blew snot all over these people's computer room, and I'm like, I got my rag wiping it up. So when you have that level of suffering, you see where this type of solution works great, and you can really get everything very, very clean. In this case, he's leaving the blower wheel on. We actually, uh, like I mentioned, in a lot of cases, you can easily pull it apart and disassemble it. Um, we have videos on specifically how to do that. It does depend a little bit on your brand, so that's why it's not super helpful to go over it step by step. But generally speaking, you just take the entire cover plate off. You release the evaporator coil just slightly. That gives you enough room to slide the blower wheel out. And so it's a little bit of an art. Uh, but once you do it a couple times, I mean, even, even I can do it. And that's saying quite a bit. Because I'm not very good with tools, let's be real honest. A microphone, not tools. Question is rule of thumb, no. I, I, I do not like rules of thumb because uh, you have to clean things when they get dirty. If it gets dirty every six months, then you need to clean it every six months. In our market, they get dirty a lot. If it gets dirty every three years and you can get away with that, okay. I'm not telling you that you've got to take this whole rig in there every single time just because you saw it in a podcast. You don't see things in a podcast. Anyway, you do it because it needs it. And when it needs it, then you do it. If you doesn't need it and the coil's not dirty and the blower wheel's not dirty, well, then you can go in and just use an evaporator cleaner, you know, use it with a, use it with a pump sprayer and go in and just kind of sanitize um, or, use a, or use an actual sanitizing product that's specifically designed for it, of which there are several. Um, but you don't, you don't want to do this unless you need to because you are still, you know, this, it's, it's, this isn't like you're still prepping, right? But when you need to do it, this is really the only way to do it. You don't really have a lot of other great options to do it well. There, everything else is kind of a workaround. Exactly. You can pull out the blower wheel. You can pull stuff out and take it and clean it. But a lot of times, these mini splits will uh, sometimes develop a, a smell from things that have grown on the coil. And that's where we get a lot of calls. Or they will we'll get calls to where the blower's been spitting something out. And you can take that blower and clean it. But it's, if it's been spitting, it's also been spitting the whole inside of that coil. And so this is really the only way to have something like this where you can take water and pressure and push into that coil and give it a really thorough cleaning, 
Um, and that's helped huge with the smell complaints. And you know, you try to put a little cleaner on and it's not gonna cut it, um, so. I'm basically just gonna do two other things in this presentation, some high points here. I'm gonna go over some of the, the, the tools that you should have available to you. And it's not to say that you have to have these on your truck 24 hours a day, that may not be realistic. But when you're gonna go do a ductless cleaning, these are things that you should make sure that you've got. So, coil jet would definitely suggest having at least a few of these in your organization. If you, you know, if you don't have one on every truck, I've got one on my truck, Bert has one on his. Um, if you're not doing them all the time, then at least have a couple in your company. A wet dry vac, important to have always anyway. Everybody should have a good functioning clean wet dry vac. Clean it out in between. Don't leave a big mess because you're going to have to bring it in the house. I suggest having the wet dry vac sitting right next to you. And some people say, well, why? Why do you need it? Well, you need it because you don't know what kind of, what could happen. And having a wet dry vac there has you prepared. Have some safe cleaners available to you. Don't just use the same cleaner for everything. If you're doing that, you're using the same cleaner for every application, you're doing it wrong. You need to have cleaners that are designed for tough applications, you know, more heavily alkaline, that's for cleaning really dirty condensers, that sort of thing. And then cleaners for evaporator coils and conditions that are also going to be in the air the customer breathes. You don't want to use anything that's going to have any strong odors when the customer could potentially breathe it. Um, keep some contact cleaner on the truck. When you're working on ductless, a lot of stuff can get in around the boards and everything, and so having some contact cleaner to get that all cleaned off without creating damage is really big. Dry steam and surface cleaner. This is a product that Speed Clean uh, makes, and this product, or there, you know, there's a lot of these sorts of products out there. Um, this product is really great if you are working in cases where the customer has zero tolerance for chemicals. If you have a customer who doesn't want any chemicals at all, and they are out there, there's actually quite a bit of them, steam is the way to go. Now, steam is not going to clean the same way that chemicals are. It's not going to do like this big foaming action and all that, so it's going to take a little longer. Uh, but it's really great at sanitizing. And in fact, if you have somebody where they're having, you're getting odors from any unit, this isn't just ductless systems, if you're working in restaurants, whatever. And in fact, in the restaurants, this is the best application for, for a steam cleaner where you have a lot of grease. Um, steam cleaners come in really, really handy for that. And it's a nice thing to know how to use and maybe have one or two uh, in an organization. You go into a case, customer has chemical sensitivities, it's great. You're going to be working with something that's got an odor, you get dirty sock syndrome, whatever like that. Steam works great for that as well. A lot of studies have been done on steam for our specific industry by the EPA, and it's, a, it's an effective product. You just have to get right on it. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the step-by-step -step process. We're going to go over some more of the testing specifics now. You need to have that discharge outlet air temperature between 40 and 50 degrees is going to be typical. Field test on the suction line is generally acceptable. Um, you want to ensure that your suction line temperature drops below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's staying above 55 degrees, there's basically no circumstance uh, other than maybe the most extreme that you would ever see in our industry where you should have a suction line on a ductless system that's floating above 55. Do your visual inspection, all the stuff we talked about. That is a picture of a blower wheel that needed a cleaning. Obviously, safety practices, make sure that everything is completely off. I wanted to talk quickly about the condenser. When washing a ductless condenser, the condenser needle, do you want to grab that real quick so they can see that? The condenser needle is a really great product to have. You can also use coil shot, uh, which is another product that uses tablets and makes it easy to clean um, condensers. And it's a nice maintenance cleaning. You're not going to generally use coil shot for like a really extreme deep cleaning. But in terms of not having to carry chemical and stuff, it's a nice product for that. And you, att you attach this wand to it. And that helps you get in so you can actually wash that uh, condenser nicely and easily. You Generally, on ductless systems, you're going to pull the top. That gives you access to that condenser coil. But there's a lot of stuff that's tight in there, so it can help with that. You're staying in my way. I can't read my sign. Whenever you are using cleaners, always uh, important to allow it to dwell. So don't just put cleaner on. And again, properly mixed, chemicals properly mixed, proper chemical. Allow it to work for five minutes at least. You give it five minutes to do its thing before you rinse it, and then rinse it really well. If you've got to do it again, do it again. But give it time for the chemical to work before you rush right into rinsing. We talked about using this. Another nice thing to use, they have this cling 
uh, tape product that you can that, you, that comes in the in the bucket kit. I think it still comes in the bucket kit. Either way, you can get it, and that's really nice for covering your electrical components when you're going to do this cleaning. Before you do the cleaning, make sure that you cover that really well. Tersh. Depends. The question was, are we okay to still use regular condenser coil cleaner? I, I would only ever use the, the most caustic cleaner you must use, which means that generally we're using cleaners that are too caustic. So I would differentiate a cleaning where the thing is so stinking dirty that it's not working right to a maintenance cleaning. Maintenance cleanings, in a lot of cases, you're not even going to use a cleaner. In a lot of cases, water is fine. Generally speaking, for a condenser, you generally use water, especially in the age of microchannel, where you really want to follow the manufacturer's instructions, and generally manufacturers are telling you never use cleaner at all. Some of them will give exceptions for very mild cleaners, but aluminum is not tolerant to highly alkaline cleaners. It just doesn't do well, and so you will damage them very quickly. And as you know, with microchannel, the walls are super, super thin on that. So uh, it really depends on the application, but I would suggest for maintenance, what we're talking about here, go to water or a very, very mild cleaner or a typical cleaner but highly diluted. Yeah, so, that, and that's a good, so Tersh is a business owner, and so he thinks like a business owner, which is a really good way to think about this. It's not just a matter of what I as a technician do, how do I communicate it to my people? And this is actually, because I've thought a lot about this, and I don't, and I haven't actually done it, so do what I say, not what I do here. Um, a really good practice would be to give people their standard cleaning solution. So using something like um, the, the very basic um, low, very, you know, kind of simple cleaner that you would use in the coil shot, giving that to everybody and saying, this is what you use for condenser coils. Here's the product you use for evaporators. And if you need something more, call your supervisor, something like that. And because then they're not going to do any harm. Um, I, I would almost prefer water. And, and I, so you could say water or this basic cleaner. Um, but the challenge there becomes, you know, it, with maintenance. And this is a, this is a you know, side product. Customers kind of expect cleaner sometimes. You know, and, that, and I don't like to even say that because it's, it's kind of a compromise, but they kind of do. And so if you are going to use cleaner, use like the most mild thing that you possibly can as a standard practice. So whatever product you use, make sure that it's mild as the standard. That's what I would suggest. All right, get everything in place properly. Putting the deflector plates in the right place, putting the adhesive uh, wrap on it is really big. Clean everything really well. Um, you can use something like this, uh, this BBJ product afterwards once you do a really good cleaning on it uh, to do that kind of like antimicrobial treatment at the end. But make sure that you're not mixing chemicals that weren't designed to be mixed. That's where it's better to use a family of products that are designed to work together. Um, it's, it's just a good general practice. And if you don't know, you, sh you should ask the manufacturer. Get them, to, get them to weigh in. Maybe get them to send you an email on it. You know, that might be nice to have that in writing. I don't know. Anyway. The manufacturers are glaring at me now. <laughs> they all want more phone calls. Clean the drain really, really well. If you do nothing else well in your entire career, and the only thing you ever do, and it's only one thing, clean drains and drain pans and condensate pumps, the whole dang drain system, the whole condensate assembly, clean it well. And however well you're cleaning it right now, start doing it better, and your life will be better, and everybody will love you. So, so. Focus on drains. Drains, drains, drains. Drains matter. You know, whatever. Make sure that you take care of drains. Spec the full system. I'm getting to a point here. Then do, once you get to the end, do your run test. And your run test, this is one of the more challenging parts, is that if you've just washed your evaporator coil with this kit, you need to run that thing before you take the bib off. And so that needs to be part of your process. Before you go reassembling all this, obviously you gotta get the blower wheel back in. But if you run this, before, if you run it after you pull the bib off, you're gonna make a mess all over the place. So like, this is another one of these quick tips that you know, I'm just trying to save you some heartache because I've done it in my own house and blown stuff all over my master bedroom and then my wife maybe sleep on the couch for three weeks, but that's normal anyway. So you wanna make sure to do that. You also wanna make sure to allow it to run long enough for everything to stabilize. And the most critical part there is the condenser coil. If the condenser coil is still wet, you can't really test the equipment appropriately. 
So you need to give yourself in your maintenance 10 minutes for run time, and that's when you can do your cleanup, you can start doing your paperwork, you can start doing all that, but you gotta give it a little time for run time. Once you get done with that, it's the same things we already talked about. Suction line temperature at the condenser, if you want to do superheat, you can do superheat. Just recognize it's going to be close to zero. Five to zero is going to be very typical on a ductless system that's running at high stage. This is, again, I'm, I'm talking like every manufacturer is the same and they're not. But generally speaking, that's what you're going to see as a standard, uh, as a standard procedure. Um, I say measure the applied voltage because that's the sort of thing you're supposed to do, supposed to say. In terms of the things that are really important, it's not nearly as critical as checking your discharge outlet air temperature. But I want to get to this. This slide, and it's in the guide, explains to you how to do the under load test, the actual delivered capacity, running, things actually operating in normal conditions test to see if it's producing proper BTUs. This tells you the calculation, delta H times CFM times 4.5 equals operating BTU transfer. But here's the real answer. Just use psychrometers and measure quick. Look at the table from the manufacturer on what airflow it's producing at what speed. So you're going to want to actually drive it directly into like high speed. Look at the chart. As long as everything's clean, and I've tested a lot of units, it's pretty much going to produce the CFM that's on the chart. The chart tells you it's going to produce 400 CFM at high speed and everything's clean, that's what it's going to produce. You can pretty much trust that. There's no sense. I've used a TAC to test it on Mitsubishi and carrier units. I've used uh, you know, a vein anemometer, a lot of different things, and they all come in very, very close. So the point being that when you're using MeasureQuick and you profile it and you say it's a 12,000 or 15,000 BTU ductless system, and then you've looked at that chart from the manufacturer and it says 400 CFM at high speed, you can plug that into the equation as your airflow then use your two psychrometers, and it's going to tell you what BTUs it's producing. Now, it's not always going to be the same, depending on load conditions, but it's going to be pretty close. You look at the chart, it's going to tell you what the capacity is. Keep in mind, the capacity is not always, just because it says it's a, you know, it has an 18 in the model number doesn't mean it's going to always produce a ton and a half. They, just because, you know, that's not how it works. That's your nominal capacity. You've got to look back at what the manufacturer actually produces at rated, rated conditions to know what to expect. But if you want to give the customer that peace of mind, if as part of your procedure you want to know on a ductless maintenance that you are, it's working, that's how you do it. I know that most people aren't going to do that. So if you're not going to do that, check suction line temperature and check your discharge air temperature. That's, that's kind of the, you know, that's the, that's the slacker's way. But if you want to do it right, take a psychrometer, put it on top of the unit at the intake, take a psychrometer, put it at the outlet, don't stick it in the fan. We've seen that happen a lot of times. It, yeah, it makes a big mess and ruins a lot of stuff. So don't do that. Just put it one, one in one. Sometimes getting it to stay there is kind of tricky. So you got to kind of come up with a little rig to, to keep it there. But once you look at the chart, you know the airflow. That's all you need. Two, two sensors, airflow measurement from the manufacturer. It'll tell you what BTUs you're producing, as long as your sensors are working right. So that's it. That's how, that's how you do it. In terms of cleaning, Top tips are have the right tools, be prepared, don't damage customer stuff, lay down drop cloths, wear your PPE, um, clean everything that needs cleaning, but especially focus on your evaporator coil, blower wheel, drain pan, drain line, uh, condensate pumps, all those sorts of things. Ductless systems have a wide variety of how they're installed. So you have to have the right tools to do the job for all of those possibilities. Um, but when you get there, you have to assess the situation. And first and foremost, do no harm. Don't ruin anything. Don't damage anything. If you've got to stop and rethink and get something else in order to do the job properly, do that. Because it, 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 all it takes is one bad job to screw up 100 good ones. And so do your due diligence and make sure that everything's square. I'll let you wrap up. Great. Thanks, Brian. That was wonderful. You talk really well. Really fast, too. Yeah, you did great. Okay. All right. So... Uh, I was just going to say, you saw me take this down and put it back up while he was talking. I took the front face cover off, and, you know, it took me like 60 seconds. So once you learn it, it's really easy to have. It's a nice thing to have in your van. I keep this bucket that collects water at the bottom. I'm not sure if I actually showed you guys that. It drains down in the bucket that it comes with. So uh, super handy thing. And then I keep this on my van as well. Use it on a lot of other things other than duckless. Um, we're focusing on ductless here, but you can look at the speed clean, uh, coil cleaning video that I did too to see how to use this on a split. So. Louder. 
Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.